Welcome to Italics, television for the Italian-American experience. I'm your host, Anthony Thamburri. The Bard. Shakespeare was unmistakably English, but many of his best-known plays were set in Italy, from Verona to Sicily, and his character is distinctly Italian. Award-winning actor Rocco Sisto joins us in our studio to talk Shakespeare's Italy. Many of the Italian diaspora lament that assimilation meant not speaking the ancestral tongue or that Soli dialect was spoken and not what is considered standard Italian. Here at Italics, we say it's never too late. Professor Margherita stops by to teach us the ABCs of speaking Italian. In news around the community, the 39th annual NIAF Gala in Washington, D.C. kicks off with Casino Night and a performance by Louis Prima Jr. and the Witnesses. The weekend's conferences and panels, and we catch up with honorary actor John Tuturro at the VIP reception. The Calandra Institute presents the book launch of Embroidered Stories, and Bordighera Press celebrates its 25th anniversary. Italian born Rocco Sisto is a veteran of the American stage, having performed on Broadway, off Broadway, and regional theater nationwide. Notable amongst his Broadway appearances is To Be or Not To Be, and he is a founding member of Shakespeare and Company. The three-time Obie Award winner has also been the recipient of a Drama League Award and a Drama Desk nomination, and he has appeared in films such as Donnie Brasco, Far and Away, and Eraser, as well as acclaimed television series Sopranos, CSI, and Star Trek The Next Generation. In New York to direct a course, from Boccaccio to Shakespeare, Mr. Sisto joins Lucia Grillo in our studio to talk about Shakespeare's Italy. Rocco, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. All's well that ends well. Antony and Cleopatra, Coriolanus, Cymbeline, Julius Caesar, the Merchant of Venice, Much Ado About Nothing, Othello, Romeo and Juliet, The Taming of the Shrew, Titus Andronicus, The Two Gentlemen of Verona. These plays, 13 out of 37 attributed to Shakespeare are wholly or partially set in Italy. You might be able to also add uh, Twelfth Night because oh. at one point uh, uh, Viola says, uh, what country is this? And, and uh, uh, the sailor says, this is Illyria, lady, which is another word for uh, the eastern part of Italy. What well, can you tell us about how the bard was influenced by Italy? It's interesting. Uh, the Italian Renaissance was the center of the universe mm -hmm. to Europe. And so when Shakespeare looked for inspiration, he looked to that part of the world. He looked to the center, and Italy was the center. I like to say that the Renaissance expressed itself in literature in, 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 in England. It didn't express itself in sculpture or architecture or art, as it did in the southern part. And as it went farther north, the only thing that was left to the British was their own language, and that's how the Renaissance expressed itself. So they brought that sensibility and looked back to the boot for inspiration, you know, to ancient Italy, you know, to Rome, all the way through uh, the Renaissance into their contemporaries in, in Italy. There's speculation that Shakespeare was Italian, <laughs> went to Italy. I've heard Shakespeare be Italian, Jewish, a woman, <laughs> a group of women, uh, Christopher Marlowe, uh, the Earl of Oxford. So it's a good theory. You can do that. Sure, why not? Catholic. We can all claim it. We can all claim it. <laughs> what inspired you to pursue Shakespeare as an actor? Coming to this country as an immigrant, I, I, my family came here when I was two years old, and uh, Shakespeare, as we would call him, was the peak of the language, the peak of expertise. And so when I started getting my education, when I started, went to the university and, and became an actor, uh, Shakespeare was something that I thought I couldn't do. So I put it as a as a goal that I wanted to do and, and realized that it was something that I could attain because of who I was as an Italian-American. You know, that uh, it already was part of me. Language was part of me. Uh, expression was part of me. And, and that's Shakespeare. What was it that made you feel like it was something that you couldn't attain? The thing that you are told that it's not possible, that you can't, that you don't have the capacity you know, veiled racism, I think, that someone who uh, had Latin blood didn't have the, the expertise of language. Uh, so I set out to 
prove them wrong, you know. And, and uh, the more I learned, the more I realized that it was a wrong thing to, to put on myself and to put on anyone, you know, because it's great when people can uh, uh, claim Shakespeare as their own. And I claim him as mine, you know. He's, he's part of me. He's part of my language. He's part of who I am as a person in this country. And we have Al Pacino doing Shylock oh, on Broadway. <laughs> brilliantly. And Richard yes. III, you yes, know. Yes. I mean, he was just, the, and he's the one. He sets out to prove everyone wrong. I was doing a film once uh, with Mr. Pacino, uh, a film called Donny Brasco. We were the guys from the neighborhood, you know, we're talking like that. And just before a take, uh, the director uh, and uh, Al uh, turned to me and said, now when you approached Malvolio in Twelfth Night, now how did, and I thought, wow, this is amazing. You know, a bunch of guys, you know, sitting around, you know, talking like this, you know. Said, well, you know, when I, when I approached uh, Malvolio, my idea was, and uh, so it was, a, it was a wonderful moment for me. You're a founding member of Shakespeare and Company. Yes. Tell us about its history, what its mission is, and your involvement. The company was founded in 1978. I met the founders. I studied with them at NYU. I got my graduate degree, my MFA, at the NYU graduate acting program. And so the, there were a core of actors that were taken from that, from that program, and we were asked if we would like to... Uh, uh, move to the Berkshires and uh, found this theater company and I, I kept my apartment here. I didn't, I didn't <laughs> give up my apartment, my rent, I still have my rent stabilized apartment but, but we did go up and um, we started working. We started working on the text. We started working on, on, uh, on what the actor's um, connection to the words were, because Shakespeare's words, you know, Shakespeare is about, uh, it's not just ideas, it's words, and how those words actually shape the ideas. Mm -hmm. You need to investigate work. And so we would start investigating these plays and take them weeks and weeks and weeks of rehearsal so that there was a sense of ownership of the of the language, which is something I never had had before, of 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 a role that that's my role, and then we started working with people who uh, were text analysts of uh, Shakespeare of the first folio, and we started working on variant spellings and uh, variant punctuation of the folio, and that connection to how people uh, related to the written word in in Elizabethan and, and and Jacobean. England at the time. I think it was to prove that we had it in us. You know, there was this great inferiority complex that Americans had mm -hmm. and still have to that to some point where they believe that the English can do Shakespeare but we can't. And uh, it's odd that it's that's patently not true. You've performed at the New York Shakespeare Festival. Yes. What's the sensation of playing at the Delacorte? It's a hometown crowd. It is multicultural. They want to be there, and they get it. In uh, the Merry Wives of Windsor, I was playing a French doctor named Dr. Caius, and, uh, and I, I was given a big dagger to play with, and I was playing with the dagger, and at one point I, you know, I had to throw the dagger, and it was supposed to stick into the ground, and, you know, and, and I, I remember I threw the dagger, and it just, just fell down. And I thought, oh, and I went, merde. <laughs> and the audience erupted. They, you know, because every Hispanic and every Italian in the audience knew exactly how I felt. And I thought, ah, these are my people, you know. <laughs> You're here in New York during this period um, teaching, um, which will culminate in a performance of scenes from measure for measure that's right. that you're directing. What will the audience see in this performance that's emblematic of? Italy's influence on Shakespeare. One of the reasons uh, we approached uh, working on Shakespeare was to find the uh, correlation between uh, Shakespeare and the Italians, uh, specifically uh, Machiavelli and, and um, um, Boccaccio in the Decameron. And there are aspects of how um, uh, plot develops and scenes and how scenes are, are done. And, and what is the premise of these scenes? There's something called a, a bed trick uh, for all intents and purposes. It's finding out and waking up. It's the old thing about waking up with the wrong person in the bed next to you. <laughs> <laughs> and that happens in both. And it's interesting to note that, you know, uh, um, uh, Machiavelli does it, uh, Boccaccio does it, and Shakespeare does it. What about, you know, accuracy or like, let's say, some kind of... Um 
reverence to Shakespeare. There are many, many anachronisms in Shakespeare. At one point in Richard II, he's, he takes out a rapier and says, my rapier. Well, Richard II didn't have rapiers. They weren't invented until 200 years later. It wasn't about being perfectly accurate. It was about uh, giving an idea of what that time and place was. What about the interpretation of Italian characters? Um, are there are there productions that explore uh, that explore this, or do or do the characters remain British? As every uh, film about Romans has a, a British yeah. accent. I really dislike English uh, accents uh, in Shakespeare, uh, done by Americans. Uh, I think that that's wrong. We should do it the way we speak. We, there's nothing wrong with the way we speak. It should be celebrated. There was a, a view of looking at Italians for Shakespeare that they were humanity. To you know, they were classic. They were all. They were the center of the universe. And so you have Romeo, and then you have Shylock. You know, uh, you have uh, you know. So you have that. You have Romeo. You have slap slapdash, knock him down comedy like Comedy of Errors. Mm. Uh, and uh, it's set in Sicily, and and so and then you have beautiful plays like Much Ado, uh, uh, incredible verse, you know, beautiful language, and so that so it encapsulates all of the human experience. I think I think uh, I think that's the best thing that Shakespeare uh, could could be accused of that he was looking to the Italians as as holding all of us, all of humanity. Is there a difference, say, between a British or American production and an Italian production of Shakespeare? The only problem with uh, productions of Shakespeare, like any productions in translation, is that you don't get the text. Uh, I've had Russian friends who just shake their heads and say, we will never understand Chekhov because it is in the way in which those words are put together. And I can, ex I can accept that because when the text of Shakespeare is in the shape of those words and how he chose those words, he didn't do it haphazardly. And the way in which he did it is like, a ma it's, uh, he's a classicist and a jazz musician at the same time. So that when that happens, there's a euphoria that, that is experienced by people who speak that language to hear it and they understand what that heartbeat of that iambic pentameter is for us you know they under we get it on a atavistic level on a level that's very very organic because the rhythms are the rhythms of the way we express ourselves now the problem with it in translation is that you have someone interpreting what those rhythms are I did a production of Twelfth Night years and years ago uh, with a Romanian director, and he was quite brilliant, but he never got that it's the, it's the words. He had five editions of Shakespeare. He had the Romanian, the German, the French, the Italian, and then the English, and he, and he, and he, quite frank, and he said, quite frankly, he prefers the German <laughs> to the English. And my, you know, I was just like, steam was coming out of my head because I was just sitting there thinking, you don't understand. You don't understand, you know, uh, when Viola says those beautiful, you know, make me a willow cabin at your gate and call upon my soul within the house. It's just, you don't understand what that does to people when, who hear those words, you know. Uh, so, I, I've, so, I don't know. There's something to be said for putting it into another language and, and attempting it and attempting stories. But uh, there always will be a gulf, I think, and that's something that should be respected and observed. Thank you so much for joining oh, us. Oh, my pleasure. Scenes from Measure for Measure can be seen directed by Rocco Sisto for Kairos Italy Theater on December 8th at NYU's Casa Italiana Zerilli Marimo. Going to Italy? Or just wishing you knew even a few words of Italian? Non ti preoccupare. Here to teach us Italian is Professor Margherita. Oh, carissimo Antonio, sono contentissimo di essere qui finalmente. Che... No. 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 The inglese? Sì. Si. Ah, English. Ah, welcome, my dear students. I am Professor Margherita, and I'm going to teach you a few words in Italian, so you can go to Italy and enjoy. So the first one is amore. 
Amore because Italy is the land of love, right? Amore is love. Amore here. Amore here. Amore. Then the second one is buono. Mmm, buono, 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 buono means good, like the cibo, the food. The food of Italy is great. Buono, buono. Buono. And the last one is very, very, very easy that you have to know is ciao. Ciao. Grazie, professoressa. We look forward to learning more Italian words next time. Every year for the past 39 years, NIAF, the National Italian American Foundation has conceived the largest celebration of Italian American achievements, accompanied by conferences that discuss the state of Italian Americana nationwide. This year marks the final gala to Washington Hilton. Next year's 40th anniversary promises a new era. Let's take a look. I'm Lucia Grillo with Italics. We're at the 39th annual NIAF Conference and Gala Weekend at the Washington Hilton in Washington, D.C. This is the gala's last year at the Washington Hilton. We'll bring you to the conferences and panels and speak with some of the weekend's attendees, including honored guest John Turturro. We'll kick it all off with Casino Night. We're here with John Viola, John Calvelli, Joe Piscopo, and a room full of people ready to celebrate the 39th annual NIAF Gala. Take it, John. Oh! First you say hello, then you get mellow. Mustn't be lazy, you gotta be crazy. Once you get started, the world is walking down to you. Years ago when I first came here to the Hilton, uh, and I was first here to, to uh, NIAF, and then, you know, it was Lee Iacocca, it was Frank Sinatra, Stallone, John Travolta, it was all the guys, so it's great to see how John Viola, our president, is really keeping that heritage and that tradition alive. We're going through this period of experimentation. Let's try different things. Let's try different evenings. Like tonight, we had never really done something like this before here at the Hilton. And what was great was that we we're all coming together. We're enjoying each other's company. We're listening to fantastic music. And if you like to gamble, you gamble a little bit. And you don't really worry about it because if you lose, you win. We really think that this is the best place to be, to feel a part of something, to celebrate something greater than yourself. Our culture is so dominant in who we are. And the idea that we can make that available to more and more people every year so that everybody really has a chance to be a part of this and every group can come and have space and have their event and celebrate with us. That's, that's, what we, that's our mission. That's what we need to, to do and, and we're going to do it. The National Italian American Foundation is, uh, I think, one of the strongest voices for the Italian American community here in the United States. At the end of the day, it's about bringing the community together. It's about enjoying each other's company, that sense of fraternita, of being one family, of fraternity, and enjoying the fact that we're Italian and celebrating our Italianness. Welcome to Rosetto, Pennsylvania, population 1600. To understand the real story of Italians in America, one needs to look no further than this little town. What the foundation has done, thanks to uh, a real partnership with WETA and, uh, and PBS, is uh, put together a four-hour series on the Italian-American experience. What I wanted to do is to find out more and to tell an honest story about our experience in this country. And a lot of the things I had seen about Italian-American history was kind of soaked in nostalgia, and I, I didn't really learn a whole lot. What's been done is a real careful look at 
where our community, I think, has needs that this film can fill, uh, and where the film and the team that's putting it out have some uh, needs in terms of content that we can provide. We're really trying to democratize the foundation, and I think it's really important to understand that what we want to do is make sure that all the voices are, are heard from and that we hear from every strata of our community. We come here and great ideas are expressed and then we sort of disperse. And through the Leadership Council, we're going to be able to have a multiplier effect so that momentum can continue. We're an assimilated community. We have talent across the board. Once upon a time, I was the past. Through the present, I became the future. And I think this is what we need to focus on now. Our youth, how are we going to train them? And my biggest concern is who's going to be a distinguished professor of Italian-American studies in 20 years? I want to meet that person now. I think I've already met a few of them. So I think Domani is so important, so don't just listen to Connie Francis and forget about Domani, all right? Because Domani comes. One of the largest lynchings in, in American history was of Italians. The Sacco and Vanzetti experience. Frank Sinatra and his role in the Kennedy election and after that. And also you're going to learn a little bit about John Turturro and his family and his experiences here and his family's experiences here. What does it mean to you as an Italian-American to be celebrated by the NIA? It's nice to be acknowledged and part of the community that I'm a part of. So I'm interested in Italian culture and Italian literature and cinema and other things, so I, I uh, it's you know, nice to be a part of something. I'm certainly very proud to be an Italian-American. I've always believed and I have been taught that to know who you are, you have to understand where you came from and what formed you. To be an Italian-American is to be so many things because we're a complicated mixture of ingredients especially if you're from southern Italy. A big thing was, you know, being exposed to Italian cinema when I was a teenager. Uh, not really was, I had, you know, grown up with the music, but not with the cinema so much. I know a lot of Italian-American actors, but I hadn't really seen Italian movies until I was a teenager. And uh, old Italian movies. And those still remain some of my favorite movies. We are a nation of immigrants, and in this mixture of cultures, is what makes this country unique and strong. We are the great experiment. To assimilate, to become an American, is a long, circuitous journey. But at the same time, we shouldn't forget and erase the tremendous sacrifice our relatives made to get us here. I share your acknowledgment of my work with my parents, Nicholas and Catherine, who I wish was here tonight with me. From the Washington Hilton for Italics, I'm Lucia Grillo. For full coverage of the NIAF panels and conferences, visit our YouTube channel, Italics TV. The publication of Embroidered Stories, interpreting women's domestic needlework from the Italian diaspora, was launched at the Calandra Italian American Institute. Let's hear from editors at VJ Junt and Joseph Sciorra, as well as some of the book's contributors. This was something that was very much part of Italian-American life, uh, history and memory. Um, uh, one of the things that we say in the introduction, it's, it's as, almost as it's important, if not um, more so, um, as, um, as a key ethnic symbol as pasta and Neapolitan song. It's really about the complicated relationship that we have to our ethnic identity, ethnic pasta. I read a lot of story and it's, I lived it. I was only 11 years old. And, but it stayed in my heart. It never left me. This was our life. I don't care if I don't read a book, I want to make a dress. Even as a brownie, which is an American-American thing, troop mother, one of our first activities was to embroider initials and handkerchiefs. And my initials that I embroidered were VG. And those are my dad's initials, Vincenzo Grillo. You made all of this beautiful stuff to be able to say, like, bring it to my dad as his wife. And then as his daughter, I was able to, you know, continue this tradition and, and give that as a gift to him. This is um, my great-grandmother's weaving from the mid-1800s. 
What did she think, Giovannina, my great-grandmother, as she patiently drew the thread in and out of the fine fabric? Did she squint her eyes into the future, wondering if her tablecloth would survive generations? Did she imagine a great-granddaughter who would treasure these labored over works of art and honor them as part of her own art making? The tiny hole in the tiny needle, too small for my mother's strong hands, better fit to wash, chop, fold, to carry half the world. The triangle girls say to the Chinese girls, the Indonesian girls, the Vietnamese, the Taiwanese, girls, girls, take your 16-hour workday and glue it to the sole of the shoe. On her 40th birthday out of mockery, and in an act of giving up on her ever marrying, Zio Salvatore gave her the trousseau. In an act of anger and despair, Juzi dragged the trousseau out onto the quiet Via Le Penne, down the block, to where the stray cats piss on the dumpsters. I used to see the ladies, uh, you know, the, um, they stand in front of the house and the chair and the, and the, the brewery. I work in the factory for 30 years. It's more hard to do work in the factory. No, this when you do home, it's different. You know, you do something beautiful, you think. Mind the factory, you have to work fast, fast, fast. So. In Jamaica in the 1940s and 50s, a lot of the women did embroidery work. All cultures relate to this and everyone loves that connection and there's also it's such a communal activity you know the, the quilting uh, of everyone together, the women together. I, I was moved. Purchase your copy of Embroidered Stories online. Bordighera Press, dedicated to the publication of Italian-American poets and authors, celebrates its 25th anniversary. Stars dance their light, night sky shivers, listening to waves, dance my daughter. The strong motivation of this uh, initiative is to make more and more aware of the uh, audience at large of the intelligentsia of Italian descent Americans in this country and how much they can challenge the uh, long road and difficult road of criticism. Before retracing my steps to a crumbling Brooklyn tenement, lowering my head, hand over my mouth, I entered the old dark and narrow hallway of the immigrant. We are what we are, not what we order. <laughs> it is normal to be thirsty and mortal, waiting to be fed from the deafening rhythm of the floor. It is all what we make of it, the miracle-making bed of lettuce, the wine and flesh, the chef's surprise. Sicilians tied a donkey to a cart painted with pictures of heroes. Everyone took a turn in this vehicle and afterwards had babies. Thus was conceived on wheels a race of immigrant heroes. I love being part of this series and the last pages of each of the Via Folio where it lists every book that came before is my favorite part. And I often refer to that and look back on the lineage. Who's here? Who's not here? Where are they? What did they do? It's an honor to me to be associated with this publishing house. Viva Bordighera! The Bordighera catalog is available online at bordighera.press.org. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Italics. Tune in to our next and final episode of 2014, airing December 31st, New Year's Eve. Watch previous editions of Italics on cuny.tv slash show slash italics and additional webisodes on our Italics YouTube channel, Italics TV. We'll leave you with Louis Prima Jr. and the Witnesses. I'm Anthony Tamburri. Arrivederci alla prossima puntata.